Welcome to the D-Spot Podcast. Dr. Dana McNeil is a licensed marriage and family therapist who specializes in working with couples using the Gottman Method. Her evidence-based practice provides support for the wide range of relationship issues that modern couples face. By using her open, affirming, and outside-of-the-box thinking, Dr. Dana is able to approach her work with couples by bringing both insights and tools that reflect the realities of today's complicated relationships. Dr. Dana features guests on her podcast that include a unique array of celebrities, CEOs, influencers, and everyday folks who are all working on navigating new conversations about how society views what goes into a successful relationship. And now, here's your host, Dr. Dana McNeil. Welcome to the D-Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Dana McNeil. This is the podcast about all things relationships and the people in them. You are in for a treat today. We have Roger Nygaard with us, and you may know him from multiple things that he's done in life. He's had quite the career. He's the author of a book and a documentary called The Truth About Marriage, which I'm excited to dive into. It examines why relationships are so darn hard for everybody and how we can make them better, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, He has wisdom in the documentary from the Gottman. So of course, I was doing a little jumping jack in my office, somebody that's hanging out with my idols. And he has a new book that's called Cut to the Monkey, which is about making and editing hit comedy series. He has quotes from celebrities like Sasha Barra Cohen, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, Larry David, He's hanging out with all the big muckety mucks. He's also a director. He's directed TV series such as The Office and The Bernie Mac Show and edited Emmy nominated episodes of Who is America, Veep, Curb Your Enthusiasm, wonderful shows. He's also won several awards for movies that he's made. He's made other movies called Suckers and Six Days in Roswell. And of course, most of us, I think, have heard of Star Trek Um, the Trekkies movie for the fans of Star Trek. And he also has a movie called The Nature of Existence. You are a busy man, Roger. Thank you for coming. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast. No, thank you. Not too busy to be here, though. So thanks for inviting me. Oh, of course. I've been completely looking forward to this. So I have nothing but wonderful things to say about your documentary. I love that you have humor about relationships. I think as a couples therapist, that is incredibly important. So can we talk a little bit about making the documentary and putting that together? Like what spurred that on for you? You woke up one day and you're like, I should do a documentary about relationships. What what was that? <laughs> it was more like I woke up one day and said, what is wrong with me? Why can't I hold a relationship <laughs> together? And Aww. well, I'm a documentary filmmaker and oh, maybe that's a topic, a good topic for one of my next projects. That's kind of how they come together. I get obsessed with an issue or an idea that is plaguing me or or I'm obsessed with, and I begin doing research on it. Okay. Just to take this example with the truth about marriage or the nature of existence or even Trekkies, I started to start reading books, you know, stack of books, three or four feet tall. And I get every book on the subject. And of course, the Gottmans, I realized once I started interviewing psychologists and therapists, Everyone was referring to the research by John Gottman and and Julia Schwartz Gottman. And I thought, well, I've got to talk to them. They're sort of the oracles. Absolutely. They are (laughs) the gurus. Yes. Yeah. And they were uh, uh, just about the last people I talked to. I started my documentary. and, And after a while, I realized they were the ones I really needed to talk to. They were the hardest to get to because they are so busy and popular and successful at what they do. Uh, I sent emails, made phone calls, and and was really getting nowhere until finally I got their publicist on the phone, or PR person, and she said, you know, they're just so busy. They only come into the office once or twice a month. They just don't do interviews. And I said, well, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a documentarian. I made a documentary about Star Trek fans just to start, you know, like the, my first right, credit. She right. says, oh, my goodness, John Gottman loves Star Trek. <laughs> Oh, you found so that, it in. Good. That was it. Yeah. So she said, all right, well, you know, get, send me a letter. I'll pass it on to them. And I wrote a letter. I laid on the Star 
Star Trek stuff pretty thick. And then they they agreed to do an interview. I got a half an hour sliver, sliver of time. And so that was when I went. And we actually it last they stayed for a lot longer because once you start talking, it's hard to stop because it's such an interesting topic. Oh, well, and they I mean, they wrote the theory, so I'm sure they could fill up hours and hours and they are very enthusiastic about what they teach. So they I mean, they're just you want to suck them up like a sponge. So I'm glad that you got a chance to meet with them and to highlight some of their work because no, they- I learned so much talking to them that yeah. day and which I applied to myself, right? I was there basically for myself with a camera. And then the viewer in my documentary, you come along and you learn what I learn yeah. about. I mean, essentially what I learned is that we're all set up at a disadvantage. We know, there's no s- class in high school teaching us how to have a relationship, which arguably is probably the most important thing we should be learning because choosing a life mate, what's more important than that in your life? And we have no guidance, no rules. And we're just sort of kicked out of high school and college. Go figure it out on your own. And we all make the same mistakes. And there were, I, I learned some such simple, basic things. I mean, there's, you know, it's many complex things and nuances and relationships, but there were some really basic, simple things that if I had just known that when I was starting out, if someone had just said, you need to learn how to listen better and explain what that means, or you need to show empathy when you're listening and explain what that means. And Julia Gottman explained that to me when I met with her. And such a basic idea that if I had just known that, if people knew these things, relationships would go so much better and last longer. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, you are speaking my my language. And I also think what you're saying speaks upon what you started off the conversation with is that you seem to have some guilt or shame around the fact that you thought you weren't doing it right. And so that plays, it's like this big vicious circle. We're not taught how to do it well. It leads to guilt and shame. There's a sense that we're supposed to know how, and none of us are talking about the fact that we don't know how. (laughs) Right. And wow, if there had just been, you know, simple, here's a couple of steps. If, If someone could have just said to me, and in fact, so if you ask me right now, if like I told this to my my nephew, my young nephew, I said, you know what, let me give you three or four things. <laughs> and this is going to make your life, the trajectory of your life is going to be so much better if you can embody this. And I'll tell you what I, here's, if I had to boil it all down to the most important thing, I learned that we all have masculine and feminine aspects inside our brains, right? And I'm more masculine than feminine. And some people are more feminine than masculine and vice versa, whatever. Who you are best with is not an identical copy of yourself, but someone who has the opposite quantity. If you're a very masculine person, then you're, you'll be better with someone who's a very feminine person because you want someone who completes you, not duplicates you, right? So knowing that, now you have to understand that these two different mindsets require different, I guess what you could call relationship vitamins and in different quantities. So my partner doesn't want what I need, doesn't need what I need in the same quantities. I have to learn what my partner needs and provide it if I want my partner to be happy. Of course I do, because when my partner's happy, I'm happy. And so here's what it is, what I learned, that the masculine needs to learn this. The feminine needs to be seen, needs to be heard, needs this vitamin about 15 to 20 minutes per day, if you want to quantify it. So what you have to do, what I needed to do was to come home, put down the iPhone, put it on airplane mode, make eye contact and say, honey, how was your day? Or honey, how are you feeling? And then shut up. Just listen. Don't offer suggestions. Don't interject. Don't try to fix it. Just show empathy. And then Julia Gottman explained to me, well, here's what empathy is. It's saying, Oh, I understand how you feel. That's terrible. It's showing that you understand what that person is feeling, not offering, well, why don't you fix it? Why don't you tell them off? Why don't you do this? That just makes it worse. Just only, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. Or, wow, that's great. I'm so happy for you. Just express understanding, no solutions, 15 to 20 minutes per night. And if you if you provide that, your partner's happier everything goes better, your sex life gets better, your interaction gets better, everything gets better. And when you don't, it gradually deteriorates. And another thing Julia Gottman told me is that 69% of relationship problems are never solved. They're just acknowledged and accepted so you can move past it. So you can't fix, you know, you know, that old joke, you know, I love you, change, right? (laughs) 
You can't expect anyone to change into something else. You have to love them for who they are. And that seems so simple. It's hard to really to embody it, but you can do it with a little practice. So you make a, a, a plan in your mind. You schedule that 15 to 20 minutes per night. Now, the feminine or the your partner who has more of a feminine persona can't get greedy. You can't ask for more than 15 to 20 minutes per night because the masculine part of the brain begins to flood, what they call flooding. Mm -hmm. If you ask for more than 15 or 20 minutes of emotional talk, right? <laughs> Talking about <laughs> emotions, it just has a limited quantity per day until it just gets overwhelmed. And then frustration happens that leads to anger and then arguments and then conflict, and then you're breaking up. So that's, you're preempting that by giving the recognition, I see you, I feel you. And then not asking for more than, you know, that the limited amount you really need per day. More than that, you're greedy, right? You're asking for too much. And then your partner feels suffocated and has to get away. Now, if you could give me one more minute, I'll tell you the counterpoint to that. This is what the oh, feminine needed to learn. You're, you're doing all my work for me, Roger. I'm just going to go make a sandwich. You're doing great. All right. Have a, a break and eat. And let me just tell you one more thing of the most. This is what I boiled it down to. What I learned after several years of, of uh, asking the experts to explain why I was having problems. The feminine person or a person with the more of the feminine qualities, the, that partner needs to understand that the masculine partner or the person with more masculine needs to get away sometimes to disconnect. And, you know, John Gray calls it going to the cave, mm -hmm. right? And that person kind of goes through an orbit. You know, I really, both people want to connect. They, we all need connection. Mm -hmm. But once that person has connection, then the desire for freedom starts to uh, to take control. And it's, I need to get away for a little while. And so about once a week, whatever, give or take, that person feels like I need to go and be on my own. Yes. Like going to the cave. Or, honey, I'm going to go uh, bowling with my friends. Or I'm going golfing with my friends. Or I'm going to go meet my buddies for dinner. Whatever. So it's the best way to facilitate that, once your partner understands that it's normal, to disconnect. It's not a something to be insecure about. The way to facilitate that is for the masculine is, honey, I'm going to play golf and I will see you tonight for dinner. I can't wait to see you tonight for dinner at eight o'clock. So now you've announced your disconnection and when you will reconnect. So your partner doesn't have to feel insecure, knows when you're coming back. And if you say eight o'clock, make sure you're home at eight o'clock or call right? other Because your word is what's important. And if it's going to be nine o'clock, then say nine o'clock, whatever it's going to be, just be honest. Honey, I'll see you at midnight. Mm -hmm. Whatever it's going to be, be honest about it. Yeah. You need that time. You're allowed that time to disconnect. You're going through an orbit and then you're going to come back and reconnect. And, and the more that the feminine tries to block that orbit that the masculine needs, you get frustration, which leads to anger and then arguments and, oh, we're breaking up and you're finding someone else with just a different set of problems when you could should have really needed to stay with that person that means the most to you and work out whatever it is that you're having a problem with. And this was the, my summary of the most basic thing. I learned many other things, you know, yeah. but that's, if I could impart one thing to people, that's what it would be. Great. You did a beautiful synopsis. I felt like I had a whole <laughs> therapy session. It was awesome. No, you are very clear on the perpetual issue, right? No matter who you're in a relationship with, you're going to have two or three things that you're never going to resolve in the course of your relationship. So the rest of your relationship is not avoiding it. So it becomes World War III whenever you guys reconnect. But what is our set of temporary compromises that we're going to be kind of checking in about for the rest of our relationship? We call it in the Gottman world, what's the state of our union? right? So this part worked great. It was good for me to go out and have bowling with the guys. It didn't work for me to only go for an hour. I need to go for three hours, right? So you're constantly renegotiating that. You're right. And if I have abandonment issues or I feel insecure, knowing when you're going to come back allows me to self-soothe so that I'm not flooded when you come back and we get into a disagreement. You did great. How many couples did you interview for your documentary? Well, I interviewed specifically six couples, and the way I chose them was completely randomly. It was whoever happened to invite me to their wedding over a period of four or five years, and I took my camera, and I interviewed them, and then I waited several years to see what happened. Checked oh, in. okay. So you Three just years later, five years later, in. seven years later, 
And I narrowed it down to three primary couples who in the film, not everyone made the final cut because some people were so happy they're boring, right? <laughs> you learn from the people who have the biggest problems. <laughs> you learn yes. the most yeah. when things yeah. go wrong. Yeah, the Gottmans call those the disasters of relationships, right? We all want to be the masters, unfortunately, because we didn't learn in high school. Often we're the disasters. So you got a hold of some of the disasters to help those of us out there become masters. Yeah, maybe you've heard of Pat Allen also, yes. who wrote Getting to I Do. Yes. I mean, many of these people, many therapists and uh, authors got into this world because they were having so much trouble in their own lives and they wanted to fix it for themselves. And they learned quite a bit and decided I need to pass this on this information on to others. So did this help you? Did you get your happily ever after? Did it do everything it could to help you be the best? Cause you sound like you'd be an ideal partner at this point. <laughs> it helped immensely to make me feel better about myself and happier about where I am in life and my place in life, which is part of the formula for success, right? You have to love yourself before someone can love you. It was kind of an old saying, but it's so true. If you are a disaster, who wants to get on a train that's crashing, right? We wanna get on a train that's going somewhere. Right. That's exciting, that's fun. Oh, this is a good train. This train is well put together and it's going places. And if you want to attract people, they say, you know, be your best self and you'll attract people who are like you. If you're a disaster, you'll attract disasters. And you're and and in this endless, why can't I get out of this cycle of disasters? Well, maybe it's you. <laughs> One of the people I interviewed in the book said, I can't write a book called What If, you know, it's probably you. No one's gonna buy that, right? We all wanna <laughs> be able to point the finger and say, This is the problem. You know, it's not me, it's not my fault. And just to go on a quick tangent, in some cases that's true. There are one of the sociologists I interviewed, uh, Benjamin Carney, explained to me how what he studied is how environments affect relationships. Hmm. Now, it's not your fault if you live in an environment that supports relationships or doesn't support relationships. The way you can support relationships is by making life easier for a couple. And that means having a, sec a security net in some way. When it's difficult to live, it's difficult to be with someone. When you don't have a way to, it's difficult to pay the bills, you don't have health care, you don't have child care. The stress on you translates to your partner. And one of the examples you gave me was a study that was done in Iceland where they looked at before and after they passed a law. And this law gave men maternity leave mm. equal to women's. So that the father can be home with the baby for the first nine months or 12 months or whatever it was. And they looked before and after this law was passed. And after this law was passed, divorce went down between 6 and 12% just because it was easier to be in that in society. Yeah. Wow. The father didn't have to go right back to work. And so a society where you live can make it easier for couples to be together and be happier as couples. And it's circle back to your question. The more I've learned about this, the happier I've become in my relationships since I wrote that book and since I made that documentary. Absolutely. It's so much nicer. It's like you turn the light on in the room and I stop bumping into tables <laughs> that I couldn't see anymore and, and banging up my shins. I can avoid those pitfalls. And I now I know where the easy chair is. And where my partner is in the room without, you know, making things worse for both of us. Oftentimes I was making things worse, not necessarily on purpose, but because I didn't realize why I felt badly. And I, you know, this is something else that uh, I learned. Oftentimes when we feel bad in a relationship, we point to our partner. It was John Gottman that told me this. And we assume it's our partner's fault because you're who's in front of me. So it must be your fault that I'm not feeling satisfied in my relationship. Well, what if that's not the case, right? I learned it's not always the case. Much of it comes from within. And if you're not giving your partner what your partner needs, that emotional vitamin, you're both going to feel less happy. And another thing John Gottman said was that relationships naturally deteriorate over time. We all we have this assumption that's wrong, that I'm going to meet someone, it's great, and the relationship's going to take care of itself. It's going to get better and better. And what John Gottman said is, no, you have to put conscious intent into your relationship on a regular basis. 
It's like a wheel that's spinning. You got to keep putting some energy into spinning that wheel to keep it healthy and to keep it good. And that it's not hard work. It's really kind of simple things that you can do. And I mean, for example, um, there's something called uh, John Gottman has. It's the uh, small the, things often. Yeah, I was looking for uh, no. He calls it the five. Um, depending whether you're in a relationship with it, with a lot of conflict or a little conflict, they're equally stable if there are the five times as many positives. Yes. To the negatives. Yes. For every poor or, un, you know, resolved issue or, or thing that I say that is not received well, I've got to do five positive things to make up for that one negative thing. Exactly. And so if you're in a very contentious relationship with a lot of conflict, that just means that's a lot of positives to make up for it. A lot of flowers, a lot of back rubs, a lot of I'm sorry, a lot of I, I love yous. If you don't naturally have a lot of conflict, Flowers once a year might be perfectly fine, might be enough to, might be all the energy you need to put into that particular relationship. So every relationship is different and needs a different amount of energy put into it that's appropriate for that couple. But if you go below the five uh, positives to every negative threshold, that's when the relationship gets out of balance and you're on your trajectory towards breaking up. And the masters of relationships, he said, may go as high as 20 positives. To every negative. So there's really not, a, there's no upward limit on the amount of how nice you can be to your partner. Yeah. We definitely talk about these deposits into your emotional bank account, right? Because if we have that big fight. That's quite a big withdrawal, right? And if I only buy you a BMW last year, and I think that's good, and we keep making these small withdrawals all year long, these missed bids for attention, as we call them in the Gottman world, and then we have a big blowout, but we haven't been making any deposits, we're going to be overdrawn. You can't have too much money in your savings account. That's never a bad thing, right? You can have too little. And that's kind of how we can view relationships on that spectrum of like, are we making more deposits than we're doing withdrawals? Yeah, exactly. You're totally right on that. And also the quantity of each deposit is the same. So buying a BMW is the same amount of deposit as giving your loved one one rose. Yeah. <laughs> It, or telling each, you thank you for making me coffee this morning. It, it was so nice to have it waiting on the counter for me. That's the same as buying a, a car or a house. Yeah. It's yeah. absolutely <laughs> so, you don't have so to go broke. How hard is it to say thank you for making me coffee this morning? Thank you for taking care of the kids this morning. Thank you for being there when I just needed a, someone to listen. Just saying thank you is right. Showing gratitude is that's another obviously a big thing. Is we forget to show gratitude. Because we enter what they call habituation. We start to take our partner for granted. We start to take our life for granted. And once you start doing that, you're, again, you're on the trajectory towards trouble. You have to make a conscious effort to daily say, I love you, to show gratitude, to express your appreciation. And sometimes it's hard because we don't feel like it, right? It's I'm having a bad day. I just don't feel like it. And we have to remember how important it is to overcome our own mood and just make that deposit even when we don't feel like it. And that's the hard part. Yeah. What you're talking about is this idea that some of us, because we've had so much conflict, we go into what John calls negative sentiment override, right? I have this unconscious bias that you're doing something to irritate me or upset me, or you're unhappy with me. And so no matter what it is, it's like, even if the copy's on the counter, if I'm a negative sentiment override, I'm like, well, you did that just to point out that I don't make you coffee, right? That's a no-win situation. That's not making a deposit. That's a missed bid for attention. That's me not noticing the positive things and showing that appreciation because we've gotten to such a habit of not noticing positive things and assuming that our partner doesn't care. Yeah, all of these things like impact a relationship and these small paper cut deaths over the course of the relationship. The average couple waits six years before they come to therapy. So lots of opportunities to do all of those things and miss those emotional bank account deposits. I love that you have taken away so much of it and applied it to your personal life. I mean, you could have just been this person that's on the outside watching the, you know, putting this documentary together and being like, interesting, next. But I love that you've actually applied it to who you are and the way that you view your relationships and communication. That's impressive. 
Well, a little bit's mercenary, right? I, I'm a very efficient person <laughs> and I like to get to the point faster and get things done more efficiently. And, I, and that even applies to relationships. And so one way to do that, you know, I've told some of my friends this, it's like, do you want this argument to go on longer or do you want to get to the end of it quicker? Mm-hmm. And of course, I want to get out of the argument as quickly as possible so I can go watch the game or whatever it is. <laughs> so here's a way to short circuit the argument sometimes just stop defending yourself and listen for a moment and then just say this this sentence just say it verbatim honey what can i do to help you feel better mm. and then shut up and listen yeah. and you probably don't have to do anything else except listen for another minute or two and then you're probably free to go now it's probably over a hug and a kiss and it's over yeah beautiful i love that i love all the tips so let's let's talk about what you're working on now so you just finished the book or is it is it out the Truth About Marriage is out. That came out uh, in 2019. Uh, Cut to the Monkey just came out um, the tail end of last year. And I'm working on my next book about making documentaries for uh, wow. film students and filmmakers sharing my knowledge of documentary filmmaking. And I'll just tell you briefly, one of the reasons I love documentaries is because I love reading books. I love consuming knowledge and I like learning things. And it's a way for me to share with other people in a visual medium what I'm learning, what I've learned. That's why when I made, for example, The Nature of Existence, I was obsessed with the idea of existentialism. Mm. What does that mean? It's asking the question, why do we exist? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What's the point of all this? Right? How do you answer that question? Philosophers have been trying to answer that for centuries. And in many ways, it's unanswerable. But I did get to an answer, and it affects relationships. And so I'll, I'll give you a brief example of what I learned when I asked that question. Why am I here has to do with the underlying question is probably, how can I be happier? How can I find happiness? When we're unhappy, we ask that question. And so it's really about, why am I so unhappy? How can I be happier? What's the point of everything? And asking the question, how can I find happiness? It's the wrong question to ask because happiness is not a goal you can pursue. It's a side effect of having a purpose in life. So the real question should be, what is my purpose in life? Once you have a purpose, now you have a reason for being every morning to get out of bed and to get at that purpose. And that's what makes us happy is having that purpose. And no one can give you the purpose. You have to find your purpose yourself. Now, we're all humans. We're all pretty much the same. We have the same wants and needs and desire, you know, to be loved, to have a good job, to have enough money to buy food and live and be warm and dry. But once you have those basic necessities met and you move up Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we need uh, love and acceptance, the ways to get that through having a purpose is to realize our purpose for me, what I realized was to be creative, if I was to put it into a sentence, right? I need to be creative daily. And for me, that means making a documentary, writing a book, talking to you, doing a podcast. It could be any, any it could be writing a poem, an architect, drawing plans, the business person making a business proposal, um, building a house or a shed, cleaning the garage, organizing your office. This is all bringing order out of chaos. Mm. That's what creativity is. It's bringing order to the world in an artistic way sometimes, and then sharing it with our social group and getting reinforcement and continuing. Now, by default, the creative endeavor that we are all programmed for is to create a smaller version of ourselves, reproduce ourselves, hopefully a better version that we teach to be even better than ourselves and until they're 18 and we can kick them out of the basement and get back to our lives again. And that's what most people get preoccupied with that becomes the purpose of their life, Mm. the relationship with their children, which affects the relationship with their partner, of course. And to improve all those things is to understand what your purpose is and why you're here. And that purpose is to creatively to share your knowledge and to be creative daily with people because we're social creatures and improve as best as we can ourselves, right? And our relationships with others. And that leads to greater happiness. Now, we don't all have children, we don't all reproduce, and so we do other things like have 
best friends and we have careers and we paint or dance or express our creativity or plant a garden. Bringing forth life in a garden is very rewarding. When I have, have had gardens in the past, I've never felt happier sometimes than when I'm in my garden watching these plants grow that I planted. And when I interviewed a uh, psychologist at Harvard who told me, I asked, the, I asked him the question, his specialty was happiness. I asked him, are people with children or without children happier? Does it make us happier to have children? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we've studied this. And we found that couples with children and couples without children are about exactly the same level of happiness. People with children may be slightly less happy than those without. And the reason is because having children is stressful. Yeah. You've got to, uh, you've got less money, you've got less time, you get less sleep. You've got this uh, young being that wants all your time and effort and, and attention. <laughs> and exactly. And so that's, it makes life hard. And so on average, people ranked raising children about the same level of happiness as ironing or uh, uh, vacuuming. It was, it's, it's stressful. But the way that they leveled out and averaged out their happiness was because they had moments of extreme happiness mm. with their child. It was like, mommy, I love you. Or, you know, here's my report card. These moments brought such extreme levels of happiness that the people without children were not experiencing, even though their level of happiness was probably more measured all the way through without the peaks and valleys that the yeah. married couples had very low valleys going to the emergency room with the children and very high peaks with uh, I love you's and et cetera. And so that was very uh, informative to me that happiness is really, we're kind of all given the same level of happiness, but how that, that quantity is spent is different. Beautiful. I love how what you kind of just illustrated for us is that there's the me stuff and then there's the we stuff, right? And if I don't invest in tightening up the me stuff and making sure I'm solid and I have a sense of purpose and that I have something that brings me joy outside of my relationships with other people, I'm not going to be able to be in a successful relationship because I won't be healthy enough to appreciate what's the stuff I need to work on and what's happening is our dynamic. I right. Don't know if you did that, but yeah. you tied that all together very well. Yes. You um, are responsible for your own happiness. You can't expect anyone to make you happy, but you can share your happiness and they can share their happiness with you. And sometimes adding those two happinesses together increases the symbiotic amount of happiness, the synergistic level of happiness. But we're all responsible for our own happiness. You can't blame or expect others to be in charge of your happiness. Yeah. Great. Thank you for the reminder. And thank you for being here. This was, I mean, this was even better than I thought it would be. You're so insightful. <laughs> Great. You're so easy to talk to and you have so many <laughs> things to talk about. You must be an awesome party guest. So <laughs> tell us how we can find your stuff. How do we find your new book? How do we find the movies if we want to watch them? Is there good places that you want us to seek them out? Oh, we all your usual places. Amazon has the books and the documentaries. Mm -hmm. Search out Roger Nygaard, mm -hmm. N-Y-G-A-R-D. Go to my, my website, rogernygaard.com, has all the links, and you can find my books and uh, links to the videos. And, and you have links to your podcast that you've been on, which are great and a nice like library. So yeah, any of any of you who have not watched the movie, I highly recommend it as a relationship therapist. Again, I love that little extra spark of humor because we often take ourselves too seriously. So being able to laugh about the fact that we're all in these crazy relationships is is humbling and entertaining and <laughs> educational. So thank you for all that you've done for relationships, Roger. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, if you don't laugh, you'll go crazy. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you again. Take good care of yourself. And I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Okay. Bye for now. Bye. This has been the D Spot Podcast with Dr. Dana McNeil. To learn more about Dr. Dana's practice, simply visit us at www.danamcneil.com.